Hi everybody. So today is the first lecture in our next module on Black and Indigenous resistance in the United States. So I want to start today's lecture by giving you all some background on the Occupy Wall Street movement, which was at the center of the Adam Barker reading that you guys did for today's class. So the Occupy Wall Street movement was started by Kale Lawson in 2011 as a digital campaign encouraging nonviolent protests in Lower Manhattan. The movement was inspired by populist demonstrations against authoritarian regimes in North Africa and the Middle East, known as the Arab Spring. Many early protesters who were part of the Occupy Wall Street movement are part of the most educated generation that the United States has ever had. Many were disenchanted and jobless after spending their lives studying and getting into debt in college and graduate school and became increasingly disillusioned about the, their job prospects and economic opportunities. The campaign was primarily fueled by social media and began with the hashtag Occupy Wall Street, which launched a march and a sit-in at the Stock Exchange in New York. Over time, large labor unions actually came on board with the Occupy movement, which came to span more than 1,000 locations across the country, with solidarity protests sprouting up in major cities like Los Angeles, Boston, San Francisco, Denver, Chicago, and others. The expansion of the movement led to a shift in demographics to include more black and brown people. Ultimately, the Occupy movement had a profound influence over other millennial-led movements like the Black Lives Matter movement, which are geared towards addressing similar types of institutional oppression. So make sure to that you've read the Adam Barker piece about Occupy Wall Street and uh, make sure to submit your reading questions, uh, reading question responses um, to the question about the basic critiques of Occupy movement by indigenous people and how the kind of goals and rhetoric of the Occupy movement differ from indigenous uses of occupation as a form of resistance associated with the A movement in particular. So let's get on with the lecture for today. So the title to Barker's article, Already Occupied, evokes the idea that subsequent waves of European settler colonialism have erased and subordinated indigenous people. Cultural historian and anthropologist Patrick Wolf was one of the first scholars to explicitly trace out the logic of settler colonialism as it was related to indigenous peoples and black peoples. So let's talk a little bit about Wolf's ideas. According to Wolf, settler colonialism can be defined as an inclusive land-centered project that coordinates a comprehensive range of agencies from the metropolitan center to the frontier encampment with a view of eliminating indigenous societies. So as Wolf points out, at the heart of settler colonialism is the elimination of indigenous peoples. And the primary motivation for this elimination is that indigenous people have access to territory which is coveted and desired by settlers. So this model of settler colonialism not only applies to the United States and other uh, settler colonial contexts like Canada, but also to places like Australia, New Zealand, and other contexts in which uh, settlement of the land base was the primary goal in contrast to forms of imperialism like what we were talking about in Africa. So settler colonialism in Wolf's model has two dimensions. It has a negative and a positive side. So on the negative side, settler colonialism seeks to dissolve indigenous societies through various different means, including physical violence, child abduction, religious conversion, assimilation programs like boarding schools, 
as well as legal forms of dispossession uh, linked to citizenship and territory. So this kind of negative side of settler colonialism is what Wolf calls the logic of elimination. So disease was perhaps the most effective means of first eliminating native people and almost by default as it was a, a unintentional kind of weaponization or byproduct of settler colonialism. So when we think about the impact of disease on the elimination of native people in North America, anthropologists generally kind of think about this in one of two ways. They're either high counters or low counters. So high counters posit a relatively large initial population in North America, ranging between 12.5 and 18 million people. And they argued that European introduced diseases had a significant and early impact on those indigenous populations. In contrast, low counters assume that prior to colonization, indigenous people were only about one to three million and that that limit in the population was due to things like availability of food, low fertility, endemic warfare, as well as already existing forms of disease that were local to the Americas. So the idea here in the low counter camp is that post-colonization mortality rates was actually less severe um, but, and was delayed by several decades and sometimes centuries in certain areas where colonial settlement remained low. So scholars continue to debate, you know, what was the previous population of indigenous people in the United States and what was the impact of disease? What they do agree on is that by about 1900, that we had the absolute lowest or the nadir of indigenous populations here in the US with about 375,000 indigenous people um, estimated as living in, in the US, Canada, as well as Greenland. So the dissolution of indigenous societies and the creation of new settlement was made possible not only through disease, but through legal notions of preemption. So the concept of preemption refers to the idea that by being the first European to visit and properly claim a given territory, a discoverer acquired the right on behalf of their sovereign and, and other Europeans who came after them to buy land from natives. So this gave the person or group that discovered these territories a monopoly over transactions with native people. So the idea here is that the European right to buy land always supersedes the native right to sell that land. This was most famously codified by the Catholic Church in a papal bull issued by Pope Alexander to the King and Queen of Spain in 1493. So this papal bull declared that any land not inhabited by Christians was available to be discovered and claimed by European nations under the logic of preemption. So like Britain, France, and Spain, the US has also drawn on this logic of preemption to legitimize sovereignty over native nations. So that's the kind of negative side of Wolf's model. On the positive side, settler colonialism seeks to create a new society on the expropriated land base. Ultimately, agriculture is at the heart of settler colonial economics and the logic of occupation. There's a constantly expanding demand for land that's created by agriculture and pastoralism, which requires a kind of aggressive displacement of indigenous people from the most desirable territories for agricultural production. So within this framework, Native people are represented as unsettled and nomadic as a way of justifying their displacement from the land and the occupation of that land by settlers who can use it in a more efficient manner than, the, than mobile hunter-gatherers. And what's particularly insidious about this logic in the United States is that 
indigenous communities were portrayed as being nomadic and unsettled, even when they themselves practiced forms of agriculture and permanent settlement. This is precisely what happens in the southeastern United States with the removal of Cherokee, Creek, Choctaw, Seminole peoples from the uh, Mississippi, Louisiana, uh, Georgia, Florida areas. These communities were settled communities with permanent forms of agriculture, but they were portrayed by President Jackson at the time as being nomadic and unsettled and therefore um, uh, capable of being displaced from the land. So settler colonialism employs this kind of organizing grammar of race to construct this new society on the expropriated land base they've taken from indigenous peoples. So settler colonialism uses two different racial regimes to encode and reproduce unequal power relationships. On the one hand, black people's enslavement was legitimized based on their perceived racial inferiority. And that perceived racial inferiority transferred to all offspring of enslaved or formerly enslaved people based on the color of their skin. This idea was codified after the end of slavery through what's commonly called the one drop rule, whereby any amount of African ancestry, no matter how remote and regardless of phenotypical appearance, makes a person black and would be treated as black under the law. So in contrast, native people and any who had any kind of non-native ancestry were viewed as having their identity compromised. So this idea was codified through the legal, legal concept of blood quantum, which is basically the idea that your membership within a tribal community was based on the percentage of, of native ancestry that you had. So this criteria is actually uh, set by tribal communities and really varies across different groups. Some groups have a one quarter blood quantum uh, requirement. Some have a half, uh, half requirement. Others have a much broader requirement. For example, the Comanche Nation is a one eighth uh, requirement. So differences in how black and indigenous people were racialized is directly related to their position within the settler colonial system. Enslaved Africans provided a much desired labor source that was that settlers needed to grow exponentially in order to meet the needs of market capitalism. So the one drop rule makes sense because it creates ever more black people, even if you only have so many black people being imported into the United States, right? Just through the processes of procreation. On the other hand, indigenous people are seen as an obstruction to settler access to land, and therefore it benefits the settler colonial state to decrease the number of native people who can legitimately claim access to that land. And hence you have a kind of subtractive process with blood quantum criteria. Ultimately, the persistence of settler colonial logics and power structures today is what Wolf calls structural genocide. So this really reveals the way in which settler colonialism is a structure rather than a single event. What Wolf means by this is that settler colonial societies always draw on familiar sets of strategies to deal with the colonized population. So while during slavery, Blacks served as a kind of economic utility uh, within a chattel slavery system. At the end of slavery, settler colonialism needed to figure out a new way to deal with this black population. And what they came up with was a form of spatial segregation uh, in various different ways um, through uh, basic forms of segregation in terms of access to bathrooms, water fountains, uh, also through uh, more subtle forms like redlining, which we'll talk about um, in this uh, unit, as well as the creation of the penal system, which disproportionately imprisons African-Americans. 
So indigenous people have remained a persistent impediment to settler society and, and have been dealt with over time through a variety of similar techniques like spatial sequestering in the form of reservations, as well as political disempowerment through things like termination, which led to the dissolution, the legal dissolution of tribal nations and their sovereign rights, uh, forms of, of disempowerment like allotment, uh, as well as economic disenfranchisement through education in the boarding school system and training for low paid wage labor jobs. So that's all I have for you guys today as a kind of intro to settler colonialism. I want you to keep this framework in mind as we start to get into our units uh, where we discuss indigenous resistance um, next week with the Pueblo Revolt, as well as the civil rights movement um, and black, black power protest um, during the 1960s here in the US. All right, bye.